Good afternoon. My name is Wim Kovitz. I'm a senior product marketing manager for Office 365. I look specifically after our data center strategy, so I guess you can understand that I'm super excited to talk to you about our data center strategy. If you look at um, what we're doing really in this session, is we're really going to start by defining like what are our data centers, how do we define them, what are data center regions, because usually when we talk about Office 365, we rather talk about the regions than not the specific data center locations. We'll also define what that means. What is a data center region for Office 365? And what's the value for you as a customer or a partner? How does that translate? Maybe the information you'll get in this session might help you like deploying more users or maybe more customers onto Office 365, or maybe add a few additional services. Now, the title kind of has strategy. So there's this kind of overall aim I need to explain as well. And I'm definitely going to do that. Like, what is our broader plan with the data center strategy for Office 365? However, if you're here to really find out, is Microsoft going to launch a new data center or region in my country or my region? Unfortunately, I have to dis disappoint you. That's information I cannot disclose at this time. But you might actually find out in this session as well that Maybe you don't need that data center or that region next door. We see that there's lots of confusion sometimes about what that data center really brings to Office 365 customers. So that's really something we're going to dive into. We'll look at things like performance, consistent experiences, but also regulations like data residency. Now I mentioned already that I was truly excited to be here and like having all these eyes like pointed to you kind of helps. But there's another reason. Like maybe think for yourself, remember that time that you were really working on something where you felt like that you were accomplishing like a, a bigger goal, a bigger objective. And I think that what we're doing here with our data center strategy certainly fits in that area. And all of you are actually part of that. So when you get that feeling like maybe you are thinking back about a sports game where you won it or where you helped win the team or maybe a great accomplishment at work. You deployed the best technology ever to all of your users. Hopefully that was a Microsoft technology, by the way. Or maybe a family thing where you accomplished success. Maybe the birth of a child or something. Well, I also hope that you consider that as a success at least. But what is our overall aim here? And I'm sure you've heard it many times throughout this convention already. Because what we're truly doing with our data center strategy is very much in line with the broader Microsoft mission. I know it sounds a bit cheesy maybe, like empower every person, every organization on the planet to achieve more. But our data center strategy is actually very much in line. I think that's going to become clear throughout the session. What we're really doing, what we're trying to do at least, is make sure that all of our customers and your customers can really benefit from the cloud. That could as easily be like a startup that suddenly can take advantage of productivity services without like any large upfront costs. Or it could be a multinational with thousands of users which by the click of a button becomes enabled of a new technology. I realized that before that click of the button, you probably have had a training of six months to all of the users as well, but that's kind of a detail in my story here. But that's kind of the thing that we're trying to accomplish. And there's lots of markets and industries still out there in the world which are not able to take advantage of the cloud yet. And if you look at our strategy, that's what we're trying to do. We're really trying to unblock those markets, those industries that today are not yet able to take advantage. And that's what you'll see here as well. Now, a big part of that is you and what you do in your everyday life, probably. But a big part of that is also our infrastructure. With Office 365, we really operate this global and hyperscale infrastructure. We actually operate one of the top three networks in the world with more than 100 data centers across the world. And throughout everything, we have like security in mind. It has been built in. You clearly see that in processes, in the policies we have. 
One of the things is like we never have access or standing access to customer data. We want to remain the leader when we look at compliances and policies and those kind of certifications. We want to continue working for that. But still, if we look at all this global and hyperscale power, it seems that we're dividing the world into like the 13 dots that you're seeing on this world map. And actually, that's something great that we're doing. Because we're actually the only global cloud provider so a provider that provides global productivity services, which can still offer data residency within a country or within a specific region. Office 365 has really been designed in such a way that we are able to segregate the location of services, where services are delivered from, and we really see service as global, and where we have the location of data, where we store the data. And that's kind of unique, and this is what making Microsoft different from the rest is being that the global provider while still being able to have that data residency. And that's a key element when we look at everything we do with data centers. When we look at those 13 dots, we'll actually see 10 of them, which we call global regions. Nine which are live, which are working today. One which is announced, South Korea for 2017. In all of those regions, we offer Office 365, all of our services, but with in-region data residency, with business continuity within the region as well. So in cases of failover or disaster recovery, even then your data will remain in the region. That's kind of different because you'll see competitors, you'll see other providers that do similar things where they have regions across the world. And part of that for us as well is of course capacity and following the growth of our services. But part of that with us is also making sure that we can commit to data residency promises, even in cases of failover and disaster recovery. We see that we have also three other ones, which we call the sovereign regions, and sometimes call them the unique regions, because they are kind of each of them unique, because there we're going really a step beyond. Like, what do we need to do for these three markets to really unblock them, to really enable them to use the power of the cloud? And we see that some of those markets need extra requirements, and that's what we're doing there. I'll discuss those a bit more in detail later on. One of them is Germany, which isn't live yet. It's kind of we're in a, a middle period there with Germany, the Microsoft Cloud Germany, where Azure announced and where we will be releasing to general availability early in 2017. Now, it's important to not forget, because for us as Office 365 users, the region is kind of the most important thing. But beyond every region, there's a bunch of data centers. At least two per region. Now sometimes customers, users, anyone really asks, like, can I choose as a customer to be in a specific data center location? Can I be in one of those 31 data center locations? Or within my region, I have two of them. Can I be in a specific one for my region? Well, the answer is no. We're kind of different from, for example, Azure, where Azure is really infrastructure as a service or platform as a service, where you really can decide and you're building yourself. We are really offering this software as a service where we are doing a bunch of things for you. We make sure that we have data residency within the region already. We have a minimum of two data centers. We make sure that we do the failover and the disaster recovery and all the other stuff to optimize it. So your, da your data will likely be over all those data centers. So if you're, for example, in the US, your data might be in any of the eight data center locations in the US. If you're part of Europe, <coughs> any of the four which we have there. And we have more details about that coming. But before we go there, I have a video here that kind of gives us an idea like a data center location. How do you operate it? What does it look like for Microsoft? Assume that we have no sound here.
Amazing. I, I always get excited when I see this video, and it's like, ah, oh! and then I need to go back to the gray and boring stuff of the presentation, actually. Such a disappointment. I'm sorry for that. So let's try to make the best of it, though. Let's take a look at the data center region, and I really define what it is. We've touched a few points already, but if you look at them, there's really three key tenets or domains which are important for us. And the first one is probably the most significant one. It's about data residency. Each of those regions offers data residency for core customer data at rest. We don't make any commitments about data in transit because we have no control over that. As a user of Office 35, you're connecting over the internet. We have no control over how your internet connection, how your service provider is routing you over the world. But we have control over where your data is stored, and that's something that we're committing to be in the region. That's also why we have at least two data centers per region. Some regions have more because the region is bigger or because we need more capacity there. And we also need it, of course, for the failover and disaster recovery reasons, which we're automatically doing for you. Then the second domain is really consistent experiences, and this really translates in multiple things. Of course, we can accommodate users across the world, even when they're traveling. We're really aiming to provide a singular, consistent experience. This translates in availability of features. All these regions, are they the same or not? Do they offer the same services, the same features? Generally, yes, there's a few exceptions, but those are mostly for tax reasons or whatsoever, like PSTN calling, where we still have to do all the work with the different governments. There's also consistency in commercial availability. We'll see in a minute that actually the availability of Office 365 is not linked at all to where we have data centers. And last one inconsistency is what I call sometimes user experience, but what we might translate just as performance. Don't I need a data center next to my door to have the best possible performance? So that's something we'll address in more detail in a bit. And then, of course, each and one of them is secure and compliant. It's really built in. I'm not going to go in much more detail on this topic because that's really, well, a topic that you can spend hours on and we have different sessions dedicated to it across Ignite already. So let's take a look at data residency. What does it mean? I said, like, we have a commitment where we say we store core customer data addressed. What does that mean, core customer data? We actually define it in our contracts, in our online services terms. And it says that we store, exchange online content, and SharePoint online content within the region. Now, does it doesn't sound as much maybe in the beginning, but then you start looking at what are the services that use Exchange and SharePoint as a data storage? And then the list becomes a lot longer, of course. If you would compare it to the usage, like what are users using across the world, this is already a very high percentage of what users are using. So a high percentage of the data storage of the data customers create is committed and contractually committed to be stored at rest in most of the regions. Then there's one other. There's the Skype for Business meeting content. Those are the files that you upload in a meeting, like a presentation or a file, really uploading, not the sharing, but really the uploading into the meeting. Skype for Business with meeting content really operates as if they are contractually committed as well. They make sure that every region we have that they are providing Skype for Business storage in that region. And then it goes on to what do we have in the regional hubs, the bigger ones, the USA, Europe, Asia Pacific, and then we see a few more there. The broadcast meeting recordings. If you're wondering where are the, the IM, if I'm IMing, instant messaging, I share a file. It's direct, not really any storage. The IM itself, like the conversation history, is actually exchange storage. But the broadcast meetings are regional today. Planner, regional. Power BI, also regional. And actually contracted in those regional hubs as well. 
And then Azure AD is a bit of a special one because we really see that one as a global one. You'll see it across the world, really. Once you look at the US, you also see Sway, Yammer, and again, Azure Active Directory. Now, although visually, the top orange box together with Cap seems small, as I mentioned, it's a very big deal already. Now, what we're doing and what we're working on every day is looking at how can we make sure that we move services from maybe only being in the US to the regional hubs, to the local countries or the local data center regions that we have. And that's a difficult balance that we need to keep. It's kind of the balance between innovation and engineering flexibility, the capability to quickly come with new services. And at the other side, the rigidness maybe, or the, well, the lower flexibility is maybe corrector to say, if you happen to be in that industry, of highly regulated industries, which are really limited to certain constraints of the industry, of the market. And that's a difficult balance to keep. Like, how do we make sure that we can keep on innovating while still living up to our promises? And that's why you see that things are moving slowly upwards. When we come with something new, like you see Sway here today in the USA, you can be sure that the discussion to move Sway into the regionals and later on into locals, that that's happening. And that's happening for all of them. Even for stuff like Azure Active Directory, which is really a global service. These things have been built like many years ago. And this needs to be very reliable because that's really core to the services. It's the thing that authenticates you every time. AAD is also working to make sure that, hey, we're in a different world. The world that the market has changed. Today, people care much more about having data in the region or in their country. There's much more regulations with all the stuff that has happened. Typically, most people refer to Snowden and those kind of things. But a lot has happened in the meantime. So that's why originally it was really built as this hyperscale global service. We're definitely looking in how we can also like adhere to the requirements of today. Now, how does this translate? And we translate this like for every region. You could see like if we're in the US, we're actually live is pretty good. Because everything is in the US. So if you like care about data residency, life is easy in the US because we don't have to really think about it. Contractually committed is our core customer data, the exchange and the SharePoint. The services are global. And the best way to see that services are global, we'll see that in a minute when we talk about how do we connect as clients to the service. And especially when you're traveling, you'll see that services are global to make sure that we can provide this consistent experience. But your data will remain at rest in the US. When we take a few other examples, like take Europe, same contractual commitments, same thing, but we see, well, there's a few things which are not in Europe. My Analytics, the Delve Analytics got renamed this week. Still have to update my slide. Damn it. Bad points. Sway, Yammer, and Azure AD. It's both in Europe and in the United States. Panner, Power BI are actually in Europe, but not contractually committed. Again, that's about that flexibility and working in the regulated markets. When we move on to another example, the last one here, as an example, is Canada. As one of the countries in which we have a data center region with two data centers in Toronto and Quebec City, it's kind of the same thing all over again. Exchange, SharePoint, and Skype, as we saw in the previous slide, in the region, other stuff out of the US. That's important if you have a customer in a highly regulated industry, they might care about these things. What can I deploy? What can I not deploy? What are the workarounds, maybe? Oh, well, Skype, really important for us. Not contractually committed. I'm not sure if I trust Microsoft to keep it there. What's the workaround? Also, those things, we, we're thinking about those things. Now, these are slides, and it's great. I showed three of them, but we have 13 regions. So there's also this website on which we publish the information about where is data addressed in a specific region. When you go to the site, aqo.ms slash 
data maps, you'll actually see that you can choose your region. And when you choose your region, you'll actually see like, okay, for example here, Asia Pacific, what are the four data center locations that we're using? And each of those locations, what do they use? What, do, what is stored in those locations? So Singapore has AD, has Exchange, SharePoint, Skype, Planner, CRM. And you can see the entire list like that and okay, where is my data stored? And again, I mentioned this in the beginning, but you're not tied to one specific data center. Your mailbox might be in Singapore today, but tomorrow it might be in Hong Kong. We move data around all the time within the region. For load balancing, when a, serve, like a, when a, when a data center becomes really hot, you might decide, okay, we're gonna move off some of the customers to another data center, so some of the mailboxes to another data center. To make sure that you continue enjoying your service without any downtime, without any decrease in performance or anything like that, this is all happening transparent to you. For Exchange, a mailbox is actually at the same time in four locations. So your data is across the data centers in your region. That's the key point, really. The region is really the, the unit that you need to think about as a customer and might be across any of those data centers. If you are looking at your administrative uh, center, administration center, actually we've added something new over the summer and that's if you go into the settings and the organizational profile, there's a new data card there that says, hey, where is my data stored for Exchange, SharePoint, and Skype? So you can actually go in and verify it. And this is an example of a US tenant, so it's pretty boring, the list here. But normally, this is the list that you'll see everywhere. There are two exceptions if we just launched a new data center and you're being moved or something like that. <coughs> or if you're a really old customer, like not an old customer, a long time customer. <laughs> Before we had Skype in Europe, for example, then you might see, oh, Exchange SharePoint is in Europe, but Skype is still in the US. Hey, what's up with that? Well, you probably became a customer when Skype was not in Europe yet. That's a concern, certainly speak to your account team or raise a support case. What are the workarounds for some of these? The most common workarounds or the most common concerns we are here are on Skype for Business because that's a commonly used service. So what's the commitment exactly? Well, we say, well, Skype for Business meeting content will be in every region. Meeting content being the files you upload in that meeting. And then we explain like, what does that mean, storage of that meeting content? First of all, it's limited in time. When you set up a meeting, after 15 days, that data storage of that thing you uploaded in the meeting is gone. So we have this retention period that after 15 days, your data disappears. For a recurring meeting, it's actually the same thing, but it's when the last person of the last session of the recurring meeting goes out of the meeting. From then on, the timer starts, 15 days it will disappear. So if for some reason someone comes into like the last meeting where no one was except one person, it's 15 days from when he leaves. If you do a meet now meeting, it's just eight hours, retention period. Workarounds for this, I don't want that. Impossible, no worries. What can we do? This is a few soft policies. One of the options that some customers do is really implement like business, like data classification rules. We have like public documents and confidential documents or low business, medium business, high business impact documents. And then have a policy about, okay, well, we stop with uploading high business impact meetings or documents into the meeting. Soft policy. Instead, you can use alternatives. You can just do screen sharing. Works pretty well. Most of the time, I think most users just share their screen instead of really uploading it, but there are situations where you actually want to upload it. Sharing with OneDrive for business, sending an email, whatever, there's, you can always work around it. It's not ideal all the time, but it's possible. The most explicit or hard policy would be to say, okay, we just disable uploading of meeting content. 
option. For AAD, we hear the same thing. Oh, it's this global service. I want to have it really only in Europe. But what's the concern? And we typically hear three common scenarios. Oh, I don't want that Maxo stores my passwords, even though they're encrypted and all those things. OK, well, why don't you set up like a federated identity system? Or I don't want to synchronize user attributes. When you set up your DirSync, if you're working with AD Connect, you can actually configure which attributes are being synced. The, the slide also has a link to an article or to the details of which attributes are by default configured in that tool. The slides will be available on the Ignite side, by the way. And the last one is maybe the most strict and the most difficult one is I don't want to share any name information with Microsoft. So I've done all the rest and even names are not allowed to be shared. Harder. Possible, but harder because, well, you'll be working not with Wim Kulvitz, but with 111801 at Microsoft.com. I'm not sure if that's really me, by the way, so don't send an email to that address. <laughs> OK, that's about data residence. I think you get the point there. What about consistent experiences? So we know every region has data residency. You're talking about consistent experiences commercially, feature-wise, and then performance or user experience. Commercially, it's about markets. Where is Office 365 available? Today, in under 140 markets, 44 languages, 25 currencies. That's not linked at all to where we have data centers. It's more linked to social, like laws and regulations. Can we be in that market? Maybe even political. Do we want to be in that market? And over the next year, we're going from 140, and we're adding 107 extra. We're not adding 107 data center locations. If we do that, I need a lot more colleagues to support me <laughs> during the year. But this is just turning it on, basically. If you think about features, features are not related to the data center locations either. Feature deployment is really these rings of deployment you go through. Some kind of genius in the engineering team thinks of something. They test it out in the feature team. It goes to the office team. At that time, I started being bothered with it. It's not really an issue unless it's something that, that I don't want, maybe. Although usually I like it. Then it goes to Microsoft. And this is really the last ring. And this is already a huge group, of course. And then it goes to the first release users. First release is something you can configure on every user in your tenant where you say, OK, this is a user on which I want to have first release features, basically. And then it's worldwide. How does this get deployed? It kind of depends on feature per feature. Sometimes it's, oh, we'll start in the US and we'll go across the world. And then it takes a bit of time before all uh, tenants and all the servers have been updated, of course. Or we start not in a specific region. We start maybe like a certain set of users. And we do those first, and then we go broader and broader. So it's not related, again, to the data centers. And all of them are the same. At the end of this ring four, all of the regions have it. So there's certainly a lot of limiting factor there. Now let's take a look at the last one, and maybe which one which we're going to spend more time on, because I think it's important. Because we really try to aim our objective, really, with Office 365, is to make sure that we can provide a singular, consistent experience independent of where your data address is. Maybe you're a US customer and you're traveling to Europe. If you're checking your email and doing work, you still want that same experience as you have in the office in the US. That's what we mean with really the same, the singular, consistent experience independent of where the data is. And we would talk about performance. It's a difficult topic. Because there are so many factors involved. We're doing extra work. We have our global network, top three network of the world. We're adding these special things which we call edge locations. And then there's the peering in the routing of the providers. There's content delivery networks. 
And then there's your own connection. There's lots of stuff that can go wrong there, and lots of stuff that we don't really control. You have your internal network, which is really client-managed. The ISP, which might be customer, or maybe it's also managed by yourself. And then it's the Microsoft part. We make sure that we optimize the Microsoft part. As soon as you get on that global network, you're in good hands. If you look at some of these numbers, top three networks of the world, tens of thousands of miles of privately owned dark fiber, what that means is that you get a very high bandwidth environment, which has plenty of headroom, plenty of room to handle the extra traffic. Low latency, failover capable links, so in case one goes down, there's still another. Multi-terabit connections, these are impressive numbers. This is really optimized to get the traffic to its destination, to your exchange, to your SharePoint, to whatever. The customer and ISP part is difficult, of course. So the thing that we always advise if customers have like performance issues is to troubleshoot them. On the previous slide, there was a reference to a site, aKO.ms Wactune, which has guidance on how can I troubleshoot my connection. During this conference, Ignite, I think there's been four or five, maybe more sessions on networking connection and performance and how to optimize it because these two elements, well, we can't control them. The key point of all those five sessions is this. The best thing you can do is to make sure that you're as fast as possible on our global cloud network. And that's also important when you think about, hey, that question, are you launching a data center region in my country? Doesn't really matter. Because the proximity to the network is much more important than the proximity to a data center. As soon as you get on that network, you're pretty safe, you're pretty secure. Let's take a look at a few examples, like client connectivity. How does it work? Uh, for Exchange, for example, I have a user in the US, starts doing work, request goes out to the DNS, the DNS server calls max of DNS and those kind of things. I'm not going to go too much in details there. But that DNS server basically returns the IP address of a few data centers. And then you connect to that first time you authenticate on the portal, and then you start working on Exchange and the front-end server for Exchange will get your data there. Now what happens for SharePoint, what happens for Skype, the same thing. Client connectivity, if you're in the region where you have your tenant, remains the same. It starts changing when we think about, I'm traveling, or I'm somewhere where I don't have a data center. What happens, basically the same thing, except that the max of DNS is not going to return the IP addresses of your home location where you have your data stored, but it's going to return the IP addresses of the data centers that are closest to you. So you happen to be traveling to Europe, great. We'll connect you to our Europe front-end servers. So that's what I meant also when I said the services are truly global. I'm traveling to Europe, I'm no longer connecting to front-end servers in the US, but I'm connecting to front-end server in Europe. I'm traveling to Asia Pacific, I'll be connecting to the region there in terms of front-end services. And that will make sure that the data is backhauled for execution. But storage remains at rest always in the region where we committed to be. And that backhauling happens over our hyperscale network the one with a low latency and which is really optimized for it. This is true for Exchange. Skype does something very similar. SharePoint is different. In SharePoint, you'll see that you'll authenticate on the portal which is nearest to you. But for SharePoint, you'll actually be connecting to the front-end server in the US. We know that's not optimal yet, and SharePoint is doing a bunch of stuff like, uh, like content delivery networks, those kind of things, Akamai, et cetera, to cache data or some static data and so on. But we are certainly working on how do we optimize this because that's our overall aim, to provide a singular consistent experience. 
independent of where the data address is. So we can be sure that SharePoint also is working on making this better. Don't remember, however, <coughs> that that connection to SharePoint is also going to go over our global network. If you would do a trace route, and I'm going to go in a bit of the details there, but if you do a trace, to, trace route to SharePoint, you'll see that you're redirected to a connection point on our network where you are. So if you're in Europe, it will go to a connection point in Europe, and then also go over our network to the SharePoint in the US. But then, of course, it's not just only data. It's data and front-end services. And sometimes, like from one part of the world to the other part of the world, you might notice that. OK. Let's take a look at some of the sovereign regions. What's so different about them? So for the global ones, set, data residency, consistent experiences. What do we do with the sovereign regions? Sovereign regions, we have three of them. We have the government cloud in the US, the network or the region in China, which is operated by 21 Vianet, and then the Microsoft Cloud Germany, which we're planning to release early 2017. They all have something in common, and that's that it's kind of a segregated thing. We have the Gov Cloud in the US, we're really separating their content from the rest. Access to customer data cannot be done by any, just any person in Microsoft. It needs to be done by screened personnel. And then there's additional certifications, accreditations that are required for public sector customers. So we're doing really the extra work to unblock that market, to enable US government to do more to, in, to take advantage of cloud services. Same for China. China has additional regulations, additional requirements. Well, Office 365, operated by 21 Vianet, is really also making sure that we can meet those needs in China. There's an additional thing, and that's because it's operated by this third party, that it's also under Chinese laws. Cloud Germany is, is similar, but different. You always have those friends that say, oh, he really looks like that guy, but he's totally different. This is similar. It's similar to it, but it's totally different anyway. Because in Germany, we're really providing a completely like, separate instance of the Microsoft Cloud, where we have not only Office 365, but also Azure and Dynamic CRM services or dynamic services in general, actually, in Germany. Like isolated from the rest of the world, if you look at the commitments there, it's that all that customer data will, will remain in Germany. The data centers in Germany have their own dedicated network between them, independent of the global network. So they don't take advantage of our global Microsoft Cloud network. This has certain impacts as well has benefits because you can really create a sovereign region only in Germany. The disadvantage is if you're traveling to the other side of the world, you're using the public internet till you get in Germany. Not, up. Oh, I get on the Microsoft Cloud network and I use that highly scalable one. So that's something that you need to take care of then. There's a commitment to need to meet all the compliance requirements there. But the fourth and maybe the most specific and differentiating one is that there is a third party in the mix as well. It's different than China because China is completely operated by a partner. In Germany, it's Microsoft with a third party in the mix. And that third party in the mix, what is it doing? He's controlling all access to customer data. Even servers that contain customer data, we cannot just go in and access them. It's actually something we can never do. We never have slack like, standing access to customer data. But if we need to do it, like even if we need to replace a server or something like that, the data trustee will have to be there to approve it, to escort us, to monitor what we're doing. If there is a support case, an incident, and we need access, we'll use customer logbox, but also with a data trustee. Oh, we need for one hour time to do this specific task. First step, do I agree with that? Or do, does the data trustee agree with that? Does the customer agree with that? 
So any data access to customer data always controlled, escorted, logged, monitored by the data trustee in Germany. That's kind of the key differentiator there. Other than that, it's all the same. Same services, same quality, same customer service levels, same versions of everything, but with additional layer of data security and control for those customers that really acquire it. And the most special thing is that German or that data trustee is German. It's a German company. And therefore, the data access also becomes under German law. So you get as a customer this extra amendment with the data trustee that they commit to not share your data with any third parties, just like Microsoft does it, unless as required by the customer, just as we do with Microsoft, like the global regions, or unless that's required by the German law. So that's the differentiator there as well. Because of that, there's additional considerations and constraints. There was a complete session yesterday on Microsoft Cloud Germany. Definitely invite you to like, go in and look at those slides. I can answer more questions about that. That's not really the goal of this thing. We can really spend an hour or more on Germany and how that data access, that access control works and other considerations. What I want to mention though is Connectivity sovereign regions is always to the sovereign region. We cannot optimize. Hey, you're traveling in Europe, so we have front-end servers happen to have in the US or whatever. No, we connect you always back to where the sovereign region is because you really want to have it in that region. That's why we call it sovereign. This is true for all the services then, of course. No exceptions. It's not like we are, can optimize it. Want to keep it there? That's a limitation. So when we launch new regions, or when you think about data center regions in general, this is at the same time a discussion about new regions as what's the value of a data center region. We've seen that it's built from the ground up to provide the security, privacy, and compliance. You are not introducing any new capabilities or new features or new services when we launch data center region. It's the same. When we add one data center location, it's usually just for capacity reasons. We have a region like we did it last year in Europe where we have data centers in Dublin and Amsterdam. And then we added one in Finland and in Austria for exchange capacity. So it's possible that we expand capacity that way. We always aim to provide a singular consistent experience independent of the location of data at rest. And that consistent experience was both performance, was feature availability, was commercial availability. So what does that really mean? Is that when we look at our data center strategy and what we're trying to do, is really to make sure that we enable customers in highly regulated industries or markets that have these data residency requirements to take advantage of the value of the cloud, to take advantage of the benefits that the cloud can offer me. Maybe the scalability, maybe the lower cost. I don't have to operate my on-premises environment anymore. And there's lots of customers out there that couldn't do that without, for example, data residency that cannot do that without us doing all the work to make sure that we adhere to certain compliance regulations and so on. So that's the main reason, that's really our data strategy. To enable customers to take advantage of the cloud. Performance, no, not really. It helps, of course, if you're closer, but the most important thing is the network. With that being said, and thanking you for attention. I know that I'm kind of the, the thing between you and great party, hopefully, tonight. It's uh, been a long week. I guess it's Thursday. So thank you very much. I have here in front, by the way, um, 13 stickers, or 12 stickers, I'm sorry. They each represent data center region. There's a map with a flag on it. If you want to proudly represent your region when you get back to your colleagues, where you're from, then I definitely invite you to get some of these stickers. In the meantime, I can also handle uh, any questions that you might have All right now. So thank you.